This member of the mushroom family, this fungus, is for the moment known only as X. It was discovered barely weeks ago growing in a remote rainforest. Science has not yet given it a name, for science knows scarcely anything about it. But it is felt that X might have one remarkable quality, that it stimulates extrasensory perception, enabling the mind to become telepathic and clairvoyant. Now that's a rather large claim. Is it true or false? The answer to that question took us on a unique and distant journey. We suddenly found this, a way to explore a continent that we didn't know existed and not many other people knew existed either. This is like Marco Polo, you know, in the 14th century, he went with his uncle and his father to China and then came back and said stories about China. And people said, oh, you're hallucinating. <laughs> you're, you're crazy. There's no such thing. There's no such place. You know, you made that up. You're fantasizing. He said, no, you could go for yourself. So we suddenly found that there's a ship that can take you to this other continent that you didn't know existed. And there's all these amazing animals and people and trees and plants and mountains and situations going on that you never heard about before. And that, you know, are incredibly interesting that are all kinds of fascinating relationship to our own selves <laughs> and give us insights into who we are in a very interesting way and in novel and productive way. So we would take psilocybin and sit around in a group and talk to each other. Now, later on, and nowadays, I wouldn't do that. I mean, that's not a good way to do it. You might sit in a group and take psilocybin, but you'd stop talking. You see, in psychedelic therapy, you put the eye shades on and listen to music and pay attention to what's coming through from within. Of course, then you do external talk in order to integrate and understand your experience and bring it back translation. That's like you come back from the undiscovered country and then you talk to other people who've also been there and say, well, what did you find and what did you find? And maybe some people are specialists in the plants and others and the animals and others and the people and the culture and the geography and so forth like that. And so it's like an expedition. In the 60s, some people used mushrooms for the hallucinogenic effects. Well, now those same so-called magic mushrooms are being used to ease the pain and anxiety of cancer patients. You know, I thought that the people that would come to us would be biased. They would have been children of the 60s. They would have done hallucinogens a lot in their youth. And they would have been like groovy hippies or ex-hippies that came to us. That has not been the case of the people we've treated so far. Just sort of brave individuals who have enormous amount of distress associated with having cancer, who weren't biased in any way by these drugs. They just were looking to get out of the suffering they were in. When the individual is told that he or she has a limited life expectancy, it is very common to have a, a great deal of anxiety about the anticipated uh, pain that might occur, and anxiety about the unknown. What does uh, the passage to death signify? There's also often a great deal of apprehension uh, about what will happen to significant others that will be left behind. I was very skeptical at first. I was very worried about taking people who were dying of cancer and who were already anxious and about making them more anxious. I spent a lot of time looking into the safety literature and speaking to the groups at Johns Hopkins and UCLA, and actually hearing some testimonies of former patients and even speaking to some former patients. And I became more and more reassured that this was safe and that if you screen patients properly, that this was potentially very beneficial. We saw a considerable indication that there was both a short-term and a sustained over time alleviation of anxiety. And here we're talking specifically about the anxiety, the existential anxiety associated with their uh, limited life expectancy. A new report in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences suggests that the key ingredient in magic mushrooms, psilocybin, may be the perfect aid for certain mental disorders. Early research has shown that psilocybin is helpful for terminally ill cancer patients dealing with anxiety and possibly people with severe forms of depression. The Good Friday experiment was an attempt to take the tools of science 
to look at this question, can psychedelics, in this case psilocybin, catalyze a religious mystical experience? Because these people were divinity students at the time, most of them were ministers after all these years. And many of them reported that they had had non-drug mystical experiences in their life after the Good Friday experiment. And that gave them a point of reference to compare to their drug experience. And these people compared it in a way that it was, again, either identical or very similar to, but they determined in their view that their psilocybin experience was genuinely mystical. The experience that day demonstrated to me the reality of God's presence in all the world and in all experience. Um, if our eyes are opened and we are able to perceive and take that in, and uh, by eyes I mean our spiritual inner uh, awarenesses, I would say, yeah, it did change my life. When they started talking about what the implications of that experience had been for their life, that's when I started understanding what to me felt like one of the keys to the 1960s, to the cultural revolution of the 60s. They felt that they were motivated to be part of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's rights movement, the environmental movement. The hippies in the 60s, I mean, we had a racial bias a lot of places, but the hippies were black and white and yellow and every other color because those barriers came down and people who took psychedelics. They, those cultural barriers were gone and they could see through that. It was a transparency and they said, well, he's just like me. She's just like me. We're all part of this thing. And if they had mystical experiences, it was even more profound because they realized everything is all part. Everything is all one. When you have this unitive mystical experience, because it's unitive, you identify with people that you might normally not. So that there's a deeper part of ourselves, deeper than our country, you know, deeper than our nationality, deeper than our religion, deeper than our gender, deeper than our skin color, deeper than our sexual orientation, that there's this core element that binds us together. A hallmark feature to the mystical experience is one in which there's just a sense of the interconnectedness of all people and things, a sense that all is one. And that experience is accompanied by this noetic sense that the experience at its core is more real and more true than everyday waking consciousness. Lucid dreaming is you're dreaming, but you're conscious that you are dreaming. So suddenly you're having a dream and you go, I'm having a dream. And you're aware that you're having a dream within the dream. Psychedelics have been suggested to produce an effect like that. And if you look at the electrical state of the brain in a waking normal person, and you see a lot of activity in the frontal cortex because that's where all the information is coming in to be processed. So when people take a psychedelic and have that mystical transcendent experience, the brain is still functioning and conscious, but it's getting no data from your feeling touch the body. The body's gone. So now you just have this basically pure consciousness. So what happens then? Yeah, I don't know. Uh, you know, I think it's incredibly interesting. We still don't know. Uh, and these drugs are the tools that will uh, enable us to figure it out. We've asked the question, where does it work in the brain to produce its effects? And how do the changes it produces in the brain lead to these uh, remarkable experiences, both of alterations in sensation, but also alterations in feeling and uh, emotion and the, the sense of being more at one with the universe? And what we found was completely surprising and exactly the opposite of what we predicted because we found that psilocybin turned off blood flow in key parts of the brain such as the prefrontal cortex, such as the posterior cortex and the thalamus. And when you look at those parts of the brain, you realize that they actually are the parts of the brain which control and integrate the way in which the brain processes information. They're the kind of gatekeeper regions, the nodes which regulate what you do and how you feel. And by switching those off, we kind of liberate the rest of the brain so that it can do other things. And that's why you get the expansion of consciousness. The core of what we found in our studies in healthy volunteers 
at Johns Hopkins is that there is this quantum change, if you will, in terms of perception of life and self and attitudes and moods and behavior. Most people are still endorsing that this experience is among the most personally meaningful and spiritually significant experiences of their entire lives. So we can now actually study the mystical experience or transcendent experience is maybe a better term for it, transpersonal experience, with pharmacological tools using scientific tools. I think that's a huge accomplishment and a huge sort of break from the way it's always been. We're just relearning how to let it be okay to call these things real, to call these practices real again. Seeing that these kinds of experiences can be occasioned and that they're producing reports of long-lasting attributions of personal meaning and spiritual significance really got my attention. <laughs>